All right. Well, it's unfortunate that that didn't just happen in, in the League. This is another video I'm releasing in a series on how to make currency at League Start. Hi, it's Lerald, and I'm going to talk about one of the simplest and cheapest currency farming strategies to do at League Start, lab running. But before I do, be sure to like and subscribe. So one note I want to kind of get into before talking about how to run the labyrinth for, uh, let's call it fun, but also profit, is something that a lot of people kind of forget when they're picking a build at League Start is what activities they're going to do at in-game with it. So with that being said, Toxic Rain Pathfinder is a great build for running labs safely and quickly. Basically, any build can do labs safely or quickly, but being able to bring both of those on a shoestring budget is not always a possibility for every build, but for Toxic Rain Pathfinder, it like 1000% is. All that a build really needs to run labs efficiently is to be fast, have high life regen, and be resistant to bleed damage from traps. And early on in a league, that is kind of a surprisingly short list of builds, but I think Toxic Rain Pathfinder is the like top dog. Pretty comfortably, it's able to handle all of the, the issues that a lab throws at you. I am biased, but, you know, that is my opinion on it. Alright, now let's talk about lab running and what makes it special. Lab running used to be an extremely complicated mechanic prior to patch 3.23 when GGG consolidated enchants and alternate quality skill gems and just lots of different stuff into the one transfigured gem system. Transfigured gems are alternate versions of skill gems. They take the basic idea of a skill, but then totally redesign the functionality of it. They're a really good concept. I love them. So the point of this strategy, the reason that it is good, is that it creates those special versions of skill gems. It is literally build enabling. And the value of this strategy then is that you're performing the chore of acquiring cool skill gems to use to sell to other players who don't want to have to do that. Is it fun? Eh. Look, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, right? Legally, I cannot make you enjoy lab running or make you hate it if you like it, but I do actually find it fun for a little while while we're at the start of a league. And then I have had enough. I think that's probably a good approach to lab running. As a mechanic, you do it for a little while to make some easy money. Maybe you do it day one. Maybe you do it during the first weekend. Maybe you wait a little bit for the meta to settle and to really figure out what is most profitable and then do it then. I've had leagues where I ran Labyrinth as my main moneymaker, and it was very profitable. It was super complicated back in the day, so there was a pretty high barrier to entry, but thankfully that headache is gone. I also have had leagues where I just do what I need for ascendancy and then never touch the lab again. So whenever you choose to do lab, do it until you get bored, then stop until you want to do it again. That may be the next day, maybe the next week, maybe the next league, it's up to you. The key here is just do not burn yourself out when you're running the lab. In terms of what you do to run Uber Lab, you just put in an offering of the goddess, you then traverse through the lab as quickly as you can, and at the end of the run you're able to convert two skill gems into transfigured gems, and you get a choice of three options, you choose the one that's the most valuable, that's pretty much it. You can also do Merciless Lab instead, especially early on in gearing, you absolutely can do Merc Lab. There is a lot of upside to doing Merc Lab instead of Uber Lab. It's, it's easier, it's a little bit faster, and it has zero cost. You don't have to even put in an offering to the goddess. All you need to do is put in your time. The only real downside of doing Merc Lab is that you only get one gym conversion per run as opposed to the two from Uber Lab. So once you're able to clear Uber Labs relatively quickly, like pretty much close to the same time, they basically are just twice as valuable. Like, sure, there's the cost of... Uh, of an offering to the goddess, but that's like three chaos or something, and that's that's a pretty low, uh, low price to get in. And especially considering you know you're potentially doubling your returns or more, I think that clearly Uber Lab is worth doing once you are able to like comfortably handle it. All right, let's talk about how complex it is. It isn't. It's just a kind of little series of twisty hallways with traps in them. You make your way through. You kill a boss. You do that three times, and then you're able to transcend some gems. The main challenge to, to doing the Labyrinth is really just navigating through it quickly, safely, and making sure you have a good stockpile of gems before you've gone in there so that you can transcend them once you have killed this RO three times. The only costs to doing this strategy are that offering to the goddess, and the time you spend doing the run, I suppose, is an opportunity cost. You could be doing something else. Offerings never really go over like three or four chaos, even at league start, so... It's pretty easy to afford them, just like buying them from other players, even just by doing the chaos recipe if, if you really have to. At the bare minimum, you want to have a handful of skill gems available to transfigure before you start running the lab, 
and that's true even from the very first Labyrinth. These can be like level ones that you buy from a vendor like Lily Roth or whoever. They do also need to be skill gems like this Culling Strike support. It wouldn't work. It would need to be a Toxic Rain or, you know, insert any skill gem. Dominating Blow, Malevolence, or like whatever. It's all fine. So if you really want to min-max the strategy, I recommend buying cheap uncorrupted skill gems that already have quality and experience in them. And I'll show that off here uh, with a, just a very basic trade search. You just... Open up mis miscellaneous, you type 20 quality, 20 gem level, and corrupted no. And then you search, and then you just buy whatever's on this list. And however many you want to buy is kind of up to you. Buy a couple, at least two per run, ideally. And this is just a really good way to kind of kickstart getting some value out of this strategy. Now, obviously, these aren't going to be available on, like, day one. And that's okay, you can level gems in your offhand weapon setup to help sell farm gems for this purpose at the very beginning of the league, but even once we're just like a couple of days into the league, buying gems that are 2020 and not corrupted from other players is a really inexpensive way to just kind of get this to really start being profitable. And the reason for this is that when you transcend the gem, it will convert into a high level gem with quality on it, and that'll make it like more valuable and easier to sell to other players than like a level one, no quality transcended gem that they're going to have to put 20 jewel or gem cutters prisms into and also spend a bunch of time leveling. You're thinking about this from the like the perspective of somebody buying a skill gem. I would much rather buy a 2020 that maybe costs 10, 50 percent more, whatever, than something that I'm going to have to put all that time and effort into actually making function. So in terms of profitability, the main moneymaker of the strategy is those transfigured gems. And how do you know which ones are good? That is another sort of conundrum here. The best resources for this are both on PoE Ninja. So we'll start with the skill gems tab and I'll just show you how to navigate through that and kind of set it up so that you can look at exactly what you're looking for. So you open up the skill gems tab. It's going to probably have a bunch of awakened gems in it once we're even just like several days into the league. Bit, bit complex here, right? So you want to set the type to normal because these are gems that are not awakened. They're not vol gems, so just normal gems. And then ideally, you kind of want to set them to corrupt no. So this will tell you all the gems that are up to level 20, up to 20 quality, but not corrupted. And it'll show you a list of their prices and so on. This is a pretty effective method here. But as we can see from some of these things, medium confidence, low confidence, especially in the very first day or two of a league, this data may not be that accurate or super like reliable. And this is something that can shift around a bit. So we have another method that we can also use on PoE Ninja for checking things out like, OK, let's take a look at ball lightning of static and, and see. Now we're at the end of a league here, so it's not as useful, but we open up the builds tab and we type in that skill and just see, like, is the main version of the skill super popular and it's very low value? You know, if a transcended skill gem is so unpopular that it shows up as being played by like 0.0% of players, it may still be valuable, but it probably isn't and selling it might be difficult. Ultimately, a high value item that you never use or sell is not really any different from a worthless item, right? So this is a really effective method. If, if it shows up as being valuable on the skill gems page and then you tab over to the builds page and you look up a skill, and it has a relatively high usage rate, which I mean, you know, 1% usage might be extremely high at league start. There's a lot of build diversity. But if it's not 0.0, .0 that's usually an indication that it is somewhat popular. And obviously, if it's if it's valuable, it's valuable. So that means you probably are going to make some money off of selling that gem. Another really good resource for this is YouTube. I'm going to give some like very outside the box feedback here for a YouTube person and tell you to watch other content creators. If a build creator with a massive following, a massive number of subscribers is talking about a new transfigured gem that they really like, there will be hundreds, if not thousands of people wanting to try out that build. And those people will need the transfigured gem to do that. So target farming that is a really good approach. There's even like a term for this phenomenon occurring with Mathel, specifically the Mathel tax. If something is like low cost and then he talks about it in the build, boom, the, the, the price of it is just massively increased, right? It goes up by a billion percent. So that's always a really good thing to like keep your eyes peeled for. And I, one of the reasons I like YouTube for Path of Exile is that <laughs> so many people use it and it really is a great resource. Just kind of clicking around and seeing what's popular on PoE YouTube. All right, I just went ahead and ran a lab. 
so that I could be here looking at the divine font while I talked about it a bit more. There are some alternate rewards from the divine font other than this standard one transforming a skill gem to be a random transfer, uh, transfigured gem of the same color. You can get some different things. The ones that convert a gem into treasure keys or currency like this one right here are generally pretty bad. Having more treasure keys can be useful if one of the league challenges requires opening up like a ton of Uber Lab treasure chests. It can be good for that but it's almost never profitable compared to transfiguring a gem. Now it is possible from these treasure ch uh, treasure chests to get like some very valuable things like grand spectrum gems that can be really, really, really valuable if they have the right roles. But I gotta be honest, I've opened probably thousands of treasure chests and I think I've only seen one or two grand spectrums they are pretty rare. So I think it's a really bad gamble. Adding experience, adding quality to a gem, I feel kind of the same way. I think it's uh, a lot worse of a reward than just transforming a gem and maybe getting a pretty big like home run out of that. I think it's usually a waste of time to do anything other than farm transfigured gems as fast as you possibly can. And that's just this top top option every time. Now, there are a few useful alternative options, and I kind of want to go over them now. Obviously, I didn't get them here, and that's fine. The one you'll probably see the most is the ability to turn a skill gem into a transcended version of itself. This is great because it allows you to take a skill gem that has a really valuable transcended alternative like Viper Strike of the Mamba or Mirror Arrow of Prismatic Clones and specifically put in a regular Viper Strike or a regular Mirror Arrow in hopes of getting that version. The best approach here is probably to do something like use a skill gem that has a valuable transcended version and no other transcended options. But that's definitely something that can and will change over time as streamers make new builds, the market fluctuates, and so I don't really feel safe recommending one specific gem there. And that, that, that like is true for me too. Like if I were in that situation where I had that and I was thinking, okay, how do I make money off of this? I wouldn't wrote, I wouldn't know right now. I wouldn't have the answer. But like I'm not refusing to say it for some ulterior motive, right? I literally don't know what the answer is to this, but I do know how to find it. And that would be to head over to the skill gem section of PoE Ninja and check builds on PoE Ninja like I talked about before. Check out the normal, no corrupt, and then go to builds and look at those those skill gems and try to triangulate my way to that and figure out what I wanted to, to put there in order of trying to get that best option. You can also get the option to sacrifice a gem to gain a percentage of the total XP that it has in it saved as a facetor's lens. This is a really valuable option if you have the right setup. If you have any level 21 corrupted gems from div cards that aren't particularly useful, this is a great way to recover a lot of the value from them. You can also sell facetor's lenses to other people. The search function is in the trade site for the amount of stored XP. Uh, let me pull up a trade site window just to kind of show that off. It's very weird, right? It's just hidden down here in the uh, miscellaneous section. It's this this little thing right here. I don't care about World of Warcraft right now. It's uh, this right here, stored experience. You know, like if you have a facetor's lens with 100,000 stored experience in it, you can just come in and tap that number in in the minimum. And then, OK, that that might sell for quite a bit then. Maybe. Great. You can also just use those facetor's lenses on your own gems though. If you have any corrupted level three exceptional gems, we're talking empower, enlighten, and enhance, you can use them on this and they probably will, re well, they'll definitely reward an absolutely massive amount of XP. I think a corrupted level three enlighten throughout the entire league is gonna be more valuable than, uh, than a facetor's lenses worth of XP from it. But an enhance, like a level three enhance is probably worth less than the facetor's lens. And depending on how far you are into the league, a level three empower may be worth a ton. It may be worth like 40 chaos once you're into a league and an equivalent facetor's lens might be worth a divine. So I would check that out before making any decision there. There are a couple of other really valuable options that are pretty rare from the divine font. They're, they're rare, but I'll just give a quick list of them. You can convert a support gem into an exceptional gem. I've never seen this one. Exceptional gems are enlightened, empowered, and enhanced. The reward is random, so I would use a blue gem just for good luck and hope for an enlightened, but you know, you're probably gonna get an enhance. It's always enhanced. You can exchange a non-exceptional support gem for its awakened version. This one is super rare, but it'll basically just allow you to trade a regular multi-strike or a regular GMP for awakened multi-strike or awakened GMP. These are consistently the two most valuable awakened support gems, and obviously, that's an insanely huge jackpot if you're able to find this result. I would keep some multi-strike and GMT supports on hand just in case you get lucky, like even just level ones in your in your stash tab just in case you were to see that. 
you you don't want to have have that hit and not have a GMP or a multi strike available to, you know, turn like one chance orb into a hundred divines, right? There are some other less valuable options like adding experience and quality to a skill gem. These bad boys here, I would never do them. I think the chances of getting a valuable transcended gem will outweigh getting like a handful of gem cutters prisms or a bit of XP. At least that's my thought process there. So in terms of selling the gems, it's probably the easiest part of this whole strategy. You just put them in a public stash tab, which I'm on standard league, so this is like, uh, uh. but you just put them in a public stash tab, you list them for a competitive price, and you watch the offers come rolling in. It's pretty easy. There is one little thing I would suggest here, though, and that's to avoid getting hit up while you are in the lab. You can go about this in one of two ways. You can go to your public stash tabs and just set them to private before you step into the lab, then set them back to public once you're out. And you kind of want to like run the lab in in uh, shifts, you know, you want to run like five labs in a row and then maybe step out, turn your stash tabs on to public and like make a sandwich and, you know, wireless headset, listen for for people to ping you while you're like putting the putting the tomato on or whatever. You can also turn on D&D &D mode before entering the lab. I mean, that's easy. You just type slash D&D &D and that'll toggle it on and off. Just remember to turn it off once you're out and you're one to sell. Now, if you don't want to do that, if you're okay with communicating and like asking prospective buyers if they're willing to wait, if they message you while you're in the lab, you can do that. Some people will be fine with waiting and some people won't. The mileage there is just going to completely vary person to person. I, I would say I've had totally mixed results on that. I've had people yell at me and I've had people be like, I don't mind waiting. So, you know, up to you. If you go that route, I find PoE overlay to be a really useful add on just to kind of help with keeping track of people who message you and quickly replying to them with a single click. It's a really, really good uh, add on PoE overlay again to say that name. Being able to let people know that you're like in lab and ask if they're willing to wait and do that all with a single click while you're like dodging between traps and stuff is is pretty nice. Now, in terms of how fast or slow this is as a league mechanic, you know, it's better the faster your build is, right? Toxic Rain Pathfinder clearly has an advantage for this strategy. It can be fast money. It can be a little slow. It depends on your build, the league, and of course, the RNG of this bad boy right here, the Divine Font. I think the biggest problem with it, uh, you know, other than maybe the monotony, a lot of people don't care for it, but I think the biggest functional problem, even if you are like emotionally on board with doing this, is that it pulls you away from regular mapping. The profits are RNG. I guess that can be a weakness, but it can be very good depending on what gems you're able to transfigure. And the complexity is way less awful than it used to be in the old days where lab running meant uh, like stockpiling 50, 60, 100 different helm bases and a couple dozen pairs of boots and stuff. And so it's a, it's a lot, lot less awful than it used to be. It's a good moneymaker, but the gameplay loop is not for everyone, including me. I like killing dudes and killing dudes is really not the point of Labyrinth. So, you know, it's about zooming to Azaro and killing him and then doing that two more times and then interacting with the Divine Font. There is a positive aspect of how many people dislike Labyrinth, and that is that they don't want to do it after they've gotten their initial ascendancy points. And so because it is a chore for those people, a chore that a lot of people hate, they're willing to pay a pretty hefty premium for the reward that you get from this place. And there's nothing wrong with that. The main difficulty of this strategy is navigating through the labyrinth traps safely. It's an important skill to develop, even if you're not a huge fan of doing this, like repeatedly as a currency strategy, because it is a necessary part of every character's progression to at least run through four labyrinths. Map layouts are roughly the same all day long, so your first run of the day will almost always be your slowest. And that then the inverse is also true, right? Your, your last run of the day will probably be your fastest, certainly pretty close. You can get into a really good rhythm throughout the course of a lab running session, and by the end, you will be flying through compared to how you started. There is a really, really valuable resource for this that is made by the community and has been for a long time, and that's poelab.com. I will put a link to it. It's a simple website. It just has layouts of all of the labyrinths and all of the room sort of orientations with each other. It also points out things like gold doors and gold key rooms. As we can see here, there's a gold key room to the like top left in the very first area, and just a lot of indications of valuable information like that. You know, tells you where where all the rooms are, how they're oriented with each other, points out the fastest path with a yellow line, tells you where the Azaros are, and also tells you where Argus is. Pretty, pretty useful website. Really good. Definitely something to put into your PoE bookmark tab. All right, let's finish up by talking about stash tabs and whether you need any special ones. 
I would say that the gem tab isn't totally necessary, but it does help with storage and sorting out your skill gems. It's a premium stash tab that I like. Uh, you know, I think it's one of the better ones. Keeping a big stockpile of gems with experience and quality in them is good if you're planning to do this as a currency strategy for a while, and the best place to keep them is in the gem tab. So, you know, it offers quality of life, but it's not required for storing or selling any of those skill gems. A regular stash tab will work, it's just less convenient. Alright, that's it. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching. Bye!